Hey everyone, what is up and welcome back to another episode of the Lifestyle Lifter Show. I'm your host, your online transformation coach, Adrian McDonald, here to help you look, feel and perform better without restrictive dieting. And today's episode, I want to describe 10 fitness habits that will help change your life. So it's hard to believe we are coming to that 100th episode, nearly 100 episodes deep. And this is also a time of year when, you know, the 2023, we're getting ready to wrap up and 2024 is just around the corner. And it's often a time of year where everyone, myself included, will just take some time to reflect what's been working well this year, what are some things we want to improve on, what are some goals we want to work towards for 2024. And on this week's episode, I want to describe 10 fitness habits that have helped change my life over the years, and hopefully they will help change your life too. I'm a big believer that successful people are simply those who have successful habits, and therefore success leaves clues. And I've read a lot of books you study a lot of people who you admire in the industry, whether it's people who are local, local from Ireland, from around where you're from, like Brian Keane, for instance. He was one of my number one people who I just looked up to back in the day to more internationally well-known people, the likes of Arnold, the likes of The Rock, all of these role models that I would have looked up to at one stage in my career or another. And a lot of them have the same or similar habits in common. OK, I even read a great book in this, Tim Ferriss, To the Titan, and he interviewed a hundred high performers. And he just like basically asked them about what their daily habits are, what their routines are. And there's actually so much in common between what every single one of them said. So this is my approach, what some habits that have helped change me personally from a fitness perspective. And hopefully they can help change you as well. So, look, we're coming towards the end of 2023. There's no point saying you're going to start doing this in January. It could be something you can start straight away immediately. Take something from this episode and implement it immediately and try to then build these habits over time. Because the more you build these positive habits, the more you're just going to have that lifestyle, build, make that identity change, which is what you want. And once you change your identity of who you're becoming, the person you want to be, your habits will all fall into place. So I'm going to start out just as we all start the day. I'm a big believer in habit number one, having a morning routine. So my morning routine has changed over the years, but the, the principles still more or less remain the same. I listen to some form of audiobook or some form of podcast or something which will just put me in a good positive frame of mind. So at the moment, you listen back to Gavin McHale's episode two weeks ago, High Performance Coach, and I listen to that at the moment. He's a 10-minute mo- money mindset attraction video. And it's just, again, it's putting me in a good, abundant state of mind. Sometimes I will listen to a podcast. Sometimes I listen to an audio book, whether it's Think and Grow Rich, whether it is Awaken the Giant Within by Tony Robbins, whether it is Robin Sharma, one of my favorite books, The Monk of Souls Ferrari. I will listen to something that is some form of self-development when I'm waking. And I will do that as I'm going through my morning routine. So my morning routine, I always do some form of exercise. If I'm back home, I have a chin-up bar, I'll bang out. 10, 15 chin-ups, I'll do a couple of push-ups. Here in Dubai, I'm my least favorite exercise, but I still do them every morning, is burpees. And why do I do that? It just changes my state. I'm like you. I'm no different to anyone else. I feel tired. I don't always want to get up. I want to sometimes hit the snooze button. And you can sometimes just feel a bit grumpy in the morning. But there's no better way to put you into a more positive and empowering state by actually exercising movement. Moving your body. Moving your body is going to change your motion Emotion is what creates emotion. So for me, what I like to do is I like to do 10 burpees. I'll do a couple of clap push-ups and just some like running on the spot or something that will just elevate my heart rate. And then all of a sudden now I'm listening to a good audio book. I've done 60 seconds, two minutes of exercise. I'm all of a sudden in a better mood. The last thing that I will do after obviously, you know, you hydrate and all the things which I'll actually go on to next is I will do some form of visualization or goal setting. So Dr. Joe Dispenza, someone who has just really changed the game when it comes to quantum quantum physics and the power of your mind. And he states in one of his books that your, your mind does not know the difference between something that you visualize and something that actually happens in reality. And again, when you go back to Tim Ferriss's To The Titan book, one of the biggest things that all of these high performers have in common is they do some form of visualization or meditation, whatever you want to do, some form of work in the mind every single morning. So for me, I have a vision of how I want my life to turn out, how I want my business to be, what kind of relationships, where I want to live, who I want to spend my time with, how I want to spend my time, etc. 
And I will visualize that in my mind and I'll also read through it. I've written down here on my laptop, on my computer. I'll read through it, not every morning, but a few times a week. And what that just does is it plants a seed of, okay, the type of person that I want to be today, the type of habits that I want to implement, and what my ultimate goal and my vision in this life is, how I want my life to turn out. And I think it's such a powerful tool because I was someone before who just, sometimes you're, you're, it's, it's, it can feel like you're just on autopilot. Like we speak about habits, but sometimes we just do habits, whether they're good or bad habits. We can just kind of live our life in autopilot where we're not really for reflecting and thinking like, where are we actually going with this? Am I actually enjoying this? Am I feeling empowered about this? Is this something that I'm excited about too? So I think just having a vision, having a goal and having a reason why it's so, so powerful. And for me, like particularly being self-employed, the great thing about being self-employed is you choose your own hours but the 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 hard thing is there's no one really to say like if you can you can sleep in if you want and there's technically there's no consequences when i worked as a primary school teacher if i slept in my principal i never did that but of course my principal would be on my back or you get a call from whoever saying where are you you're meant to be here for nine o'clock to teach your students when you're self-employed you have to be very very self-accountable and hold yourself accountable to a high standard and it can just sometimes it can often be a case that you can just go through your day on on autopilot and you're not really thinking and reflecting on what you're actually doing so that's why for me this year one thing that's really really enlightened me is just having a vision and having a strong reason why I'm working towards that every single day and when you've got a future that you want to work towards that's what really helps me get up in the cold well it's not so cold over here at the moment but on the dark winter mornings when you want to sleep in I always think of the vision the goal that I have in mind the impact that I want to make and that's what really helps me out so first thing that I would say for everyone is to have a morning routine so mine involves some form of podcast or some form of personal development some form of exercise and then something to work in the mind, whether that's gratitude, which I'll also do. So I'll think of things that I'm grateful for, but also visualization of how I want my life to turn out. Number two, so hydration. So I have a client who is very, very, just started out working with me the past two weeks. Guy's been working out five, six days a week in the gym and he's making some really, really solid progress. He wants to take things up to a newer level and he's filling out his check-in form this week. And one of the questions that I have in my check-in form is your average daily water intake. And this guy was like, I was like, whoa, I was surprised. Like for a guy who's working out five, six times a week, only having like one, one and a half liters of water a day, which was definitely not enough for him based on his activity levels, based on his overall goals. So I'm a big believer in front loading the day with water. And what I will do is before, before I go to bed, I whether if I'm at home, I'll bring a pint class with me. If I'm here in Dubai, but just a big bottle of water, 1.5 liter bottle of water. And I'll have drank one liter of water inside the first 30 minutes of the day. I will knock it back. And I'm a big believer in just front loading your day and starting off hydrated. This thing, this means then that obviously I'm going to get a better pump in my workout. I'm going to be have more energy throughout the day. And when you think about it, like 70% of your skeletal muscle is made up of water. So there's a lot to be said for actually drinking water and staying hydrated. I do not recommend anyone to start your day off with caffeine. I just know myself from personal experience, first of all, I don't enjoy my coffee as much if I'm dehydrated. If I haven't drank any water and the first thing I have is, is coffee, it almost gets stuck in my throat. But secondly, you lose water in your sleep through respiration. So it's really important you rehydrate first thing in the day. So what are some daily recommendations? What I would say is whatever your body weight is in kilos, at the lower end, multiply that by 30 and the higher end, multiply that by 50. So let's just say you're an 80 kilo guy times 30. That's 2.4 liters of water a day times 50. That's four liters of water a day. That's not that hard at all. When you think about it, four liters of water a day for someone who's in that 80 kilo bracket range. If you get a liter in first thing in the morning, like I do, you do a workout, you might drink another liter, liter and a half there. That's already two and a half liters gone. And then throughout the day, drink a pint of water, drink a glass of water before every meal. You have four meals, four glasses of water, and that's you sorted. It's not that difficult. Again, it's about implementing this as a habit. So a, a really, really productive habit for anyone will be to stay hydrated and start your day off hydrated first thing in the morning, okay? Uh, habit number three is meal planning and meal prepping. 
So meal prepping is when you actually prepare your food in advance. But a step back from that, which I recommend everyone to do, is to meal plan it. So I recently had a call with someone and what she told me was, when I'm tired, I always opt for sugar. So when you think about it, Charles Duhigg wrote a great book called The Power of Habit. Again, what we're talking about in this podcast. And he speaks about something called the Q routine reward. So the Q is what is the trigger that causes you to do the routine and what's the reward you get from that? So in this in this client situation, let's just say that her name was Sarah. Sarah's Q was, okay, she's tired. What's the routine? She goes for sugar. What's the reward? You get that short-term hit of sugar, which would increase your energy levels. Now, it can be sometimes difficult to change the cue. In other words, sometimes we, we will inevitably feel tired. You might feel stressed. But it's 100% within our control to change the routine. So I recommend a routine for her, for Sarah, would be, okay, the cue is you're feeling tired. The routine is I have my meals prepared and planned for the day before so that, so that when I'm feeling tired, I could just grab those and set option for sugar. The reward is you get a longer term sustainable energy fix throughout the day rather than a short term hit from sugar. So that's why at its baseline level, something I say to all my clients, we do something called a Sunday sermon checklist. Every single week I send it out. And the first thing that I'll always set, tell everyone to do is to plan or prepare your meals for the week. And that doesn't necessarily mean you have to batch cook for a full week. It doesn't mean you have to cook for three days. It doesn't mean you have to prepare all your food. That can definitely help. And I do recommend it for most of my clients. But some people like to cook fresh every single day or maybe use today's dinner for tomorrow's lunch. But one thing I'll ask all of my clients to do is not to go to bed without deciding in advance what you're going to eat the following day. So, for example, one of my clients, Ross, what he likes to do is he'll go onto his My Fitness Pal the night before. Let's just say today is Wednesday. On Wednesday night, he'll go onto his My Fitness Pal and he'll log his food for Thursday. The benefit of this being first, being, first of all, it just eliminates decision fatigue. Every time you have to make a decision of what you're going to eat or what you're going to have, it does, it can tire you out. And if you're already feeling tired after a stressful day at work, the last thing you want to do is get into emotional eating where you're just eating based on your emotions. If you know in advance what you're going to have at what time of the day, it just eliminates all that decision fatigue and it gives you a proper structure. So at the very, very baseline level, one habit that will definitely change your, your health and fitness this year and next year is meal planning and meal prepping. So decide in advance what you're going to eat the following day and a bonus or a benefit would be to prepare or cook your meals, batch cook your meals in advance so you don't need to resort to the sugar like Sarah did whenever she was feeling tired. Next up then, it is the importance of type of food and food quality. So I don't necessarily think that I follow a diet, but I do follow a lot of principles. And again, you look at the most successful, successful, quote unquote, successful people in the industry who are the most jacked, who are the most athletic, who are the most lean. The majority of them don't follow any diet as such. Like there's not too many people who I personally look up to who follow, would say, just solely a ketogenic diet or a carnivore diet or a high carb or a low carb diet. But what they do follow is a lot of principles. And if you understand the principles, you can choose your own methods, you can choose your own diet. And for me, a principle that I adhere to for myself and for my clients, I try holding to a high standard is the 90, 10 or 80, 20 principle. Now, everyone's probably heard about it, but what does it actually mean? There's a big misconception. So the 80-20 principle is 80% of your calories come from single ingredient whole foods, and then 20% come from more processed foods. But there's a difference between 80% of your foods and 80% of your calories. And what I mean by that is, let's just say you're in a 2000 calorie diet. It doesn't mean that, okay, you have 10 foods in the day. Eight of those foods are quote unquote whole foods and two of those foods are processed foods. Because if that was the case, imagine you just had a McDonald's and a cheeseburger and they were your two processed foods. And then for the rest of the day, it was just things like chicken fillet, steak, eggs, etc. That wouldn't really balance properly in 80, 20 in terms of calories. So it has to be 80% of your calories coming from whole foods. So in this example here, you're following a 2000 calorie diet. That means roughly 1600 calories from whole foods, 400 calories from more processed foods. I like to step it up a notch. I genuinely don't feel like I'm following a diet. I'm probably 90, 10 at the moment where 90% of my calories are coming from single ingredient whole foods. An apple is just an apple. An apple juice is 
might contain elements of an apple, but it's also got added ingredients. A chicken fillet is just a chicken fillet. A banana is just a banana. Oats are just oats. Okay, so that's what I mean by whole foods, whereas processed foods, it can be obviously the likes of your bread, the likes of your bars, your chocolate, your protein bars. All of these foods are technically processed because they have more than one ingredient. And so for me, one thing that I always adhere to is following the 90, 10 or 80, 20, 80, 20 principle. 80, 20, that's going to give you a B. If you want to get an A, that's going to be 90, 90, 10. Again, it's what you're going to adhere to, what you're going to be able to adhere to. And what I will say is I don't always, I'm not always 90, 10. Like sometimes Christmas time now coming up, I'm definitely going to be more probably 70, 30 because I genuinely, I don't feel like I'm following a diet. Anytime I go to an airport, for instance, anytime I'm traveling, I will always make sure that I'll start my day off with something, some form of, of food that contains a good lean source of protein, but also vegetables. Because anyone who travels frequently knows it's very, very difficult to get some vegetables when you are on the go. So I just love eating vegetables. I like eating clean. I like the way it makes me feel. All right. So for you, what I would recommend is try to set some baseline standards for yourself that, OK, I'm going to have this amount of calories, but then 80, 20 principle, maybe to start out that 80 percent are whole foods and 20 percent are more processed foods. And then sometimes in the year, you might adjust the diet like Christmas time, as I said, you might go 60, 40. But you're doing always something rather than having an all or nothing mindset, because if there's one thing that holds people back. It's the idea of perfection, that they have to follow a perfect diet. They have to be 10 out of 10 perfect. And this is where this is why so many people typically are able to follow something for a week, maybe two weeks. But then usually week three, it's when the honeymoon phase of following something new wears off. And now it becomes inevitable that, OK, I'm not sure if I'm going to be able to sustain this long term. Whereas if you implement the 80-20 principle where you include foods that you enjoy every day, but for the most part, you're having whole foods, it will make it feel like it's not a diet, but rather a lifestyle change. OK, so that's where the 80-20 or 90-10 principle comes in. Some principles that I like to adhere to. So would be obviously having protein at every meal, having single ingredient whole foods. And then eating something that I enjoy every single day, whether that's a protein bar, whether that's some chocolate, eating something that I enjoy every single day. But regardless for you, one thing that I would recommend is following that 80, 20 or 90, 90, 10 principle. And just finally, type of food you eat does matter. OK, the type of food you eat matters a lot. So let's just say, for example, when you consume protein and you consume a whole source of protein, whether that's chicken, whether that's eggs, whether that's turkey. 20 to 30 percent of the calories you consume for protein are actually broken down as you eat the protein. OK, so you don't actually digest or absorb all of those protein calories. 20 to 30 percent of those are actually used up as you digest protein. When you eat, consume carbohydrates, about six to 10 percent of those car of those calories are actually used to break down the carbohydrates that you're eating. And when you're eating healthy fats, zero to three percent of those calories are used to break it down. So that's why protein has a higher thermic effect of food and you burn more calories eating protein than you do eating carbohydrates and fats. And a really interesting study where a group, a group of people, I don't have the exact specifics. I was just starting it yesterday that they consumed something like six or seven grams of protein per kilo of body weight. So they were in a calorie surplus of about seven or eight hundred calories per day. But the calorie surplus came purely from just eating more protein. And over like a 12 week period, they didn't gain any excess body fat compared to a control group who were eating at maintenance. So it just goes to show that, OK, it's not only the 80 20 principle, but making sure that you're eating the right amount and the right type of food, which is why I'm a big believer in having a high protein diet, particularly if you're doing a body weight cut, because protein will help keep you fuller for longer. It's going to help preserve lean muscle mass. And as well as this, you burn more calories eating protein than any other food. OK, so habit number five, then. So going off that is the importance of calories, protein and fiber. So there's a lot of diets out there. And one thing that anyone who has a consultation call to work with me one to one, I'll always ask what they would have tried in the past. And a common theme a lot of people say is they just have some element of information overload. God, I'm looking at this and someone's saying keto is the best diet. Someone else is saying the high carb diet is the best. Someone else saying low carb. Someone else saying no carbs after 6 p.m. And they just don't really know where to start. But again, as I said previously, if you understand the principles, you can choose your own methods. And for me, some really important principles to adhere to is, first of all, 
calories are important. They're at the baseline. And your overall daily caloric intake is going to dictate whether you're losing fat, whether you're maintaining your weight, or whether you're gaining muscle. So if you want to lose fat, you have to be in a calorie deficit. You want to maintain, that's calorie maintenance. You want to build some muscle. Typically, you got to be in the calorie circuits. So one habit that's going to really help you do this is to use my fitness pal and actually track your calories. Like I remember I was having a call with one guy and I asked him, you know, what did you eat yesterday? How many calories did you eat? He said, I have no idea. I've never counted my calories before. I just said, out of curiosity, if you were to estimate how many calories would you say that you would have consumed yesterday? So he told me maybe he had some porridge and some berries. He had some peanut butter. He had some rice cakes. He had some yogurt. He had some kind of a wrap for lunch. He had a healthy stir fry. He had some avocado for dinner. And because he'd never done this before, like these are all, quote unquote, relatively healthy foods that he was eating. His estimate was 1,000 calories. And that just made me like, whoa, okay. You know, we need to build your education on actually how many calories are in certain foods, foods that are higher in calories, foods that are lower in calories. And I would say he was probably 2,000 calories. He probably had minimum. So he was 100% off. He, his estimate was 1,000 calories, when in reality, he's probably eating more like 2,000 calories. So what I will say is if you're not assessing, you're just guessing. And it's not long-term it doesn't need to be a case that you have to track your calories for the rest of your life. But think of it like this. Nutrition is like a, like getting a degree. You don't just go into college. I didn't don't go to college and just get handed my four-year four year degree for becoming a primary school teacher. You have to earn the right to get that degree by working for four years, doing the assignment, doing the work, doing the, um, doing the teaching practice, et cetera, et cetera. Nutrition is the same. And for a lot of people starting out, okay, you want to obviously include the foods that you enjoy. You want to make it sustainable. You want to make a lifestyle change. But you have to have a baseline knowledge and education of how actually calories work and how foods work so you can do that. And for a lot of people, that would require and does require a period of time where you track your calories so you have a better understanding of, okay, there's roughly this amount of calories in 100 grams of oats. God, I never knew that peanut butter is so calorie dense. I did not realize that I could eat all of these vegetables, all of these white meat, and it still only comes at 350 calories. Wow, this surprised me that adding one or two tablespoons of olive oil with some nut butter, with some avocado, that equates to 500 calories. All of these things, you're not going to learn by just guessing. You have to have some element of tracking and assessment to put that in place, which is why I really recommend everyone to do to go through a period of time where they use MyFitnessPal or any other tracking app out there. That's what I ask my clients to use, where you track your calories. And then over time, the goal should be if you get to a place where you get your degree, a degree in nutrition or in a lifestyle nutrition, what I like to call it is where you are able to maintain physique in a body that you're proud of, that you feel energized, you feel fueled in without necessarily having to track your calories. But typically for most people, it does require to go through a period where you have that knowledge, you build that education. OK, so after calories, then just the importance of protein and having protein at every single meal. So that's something that I a principle that I adhere to. Anytime I'm doing my client check and I'm looking at their my fitness pal, I'm always looking, okay, you can see their breakfast, their lunch, their dinner, their snacks. I'm always looking for every single meal. Where's the protein? Where's the protein? Where's the protein? And for anyone out here, listen, what I typically recommend the high end is multiply your body weight in two, multiply your body weight in kilos by two. And that's a good, ambitious protein target for you. So again, just using the 80 kilo guys, the example, your 80 kilos, 160 grams of protein. And then to break that down further, Another suggested tip that I'll give is, okay, if you need to get 160 grams of protein in a day, how many meals a day are you having? So if you're having four meals a day, divide 160 by four. And that means roughly per meal, you want to be getting in 40 grams of protein. So for breakfast, that could be something like overnight oats with a scoop of Greek yogurt and some protein powder. It could be some eggs and egg whites. It could be an omelette. It could be my Mac lifestyle fitness fry up where you're having turkey rashers, turkey sausages. You might have some uh, turkey pudding. That's going to give you a good, clean 40 grams of protein punch. For lunch and for dinner, the simple way to, is just to add more of your existing source of protein. So a lot of people that might ask, how can I increase my protein intake at lunch? If you're having 100 grams of chicken, just bump that up to 200 grams. And that's going to give you 50 grams probably plus. If you're having 100 grams of steak, have a bit more, 150 grams. Just make sure you're having enough protein at lunchtime, same at dinner time, and then snacks in between meals. So 
that could be things like convenient snack, Greek yogurt, protein powder, protein bars, all of these kind of convenient foods, which can come in handy to make up or supplement protein in your diet. But what I would typically recommend for everyone is if you're having four meals a day with protein, at least two of those meals are whole, whole source of protein, which contain all the essential amino acids. So that'd be things like eggs, egg whites, chicken, turkey, steak, fish, and so on. Okay, so that's the importance of calories, the importance of protein, and finally the importance of fiber. So fiber is going to help you digest your food better. And a typical uh, fiber intake target is approximately 13 grams of fiber. This is what the daily, the, the nutrition recommendations are. 30 gram, 13 grams of fiber per 1,000 calories you consume. So if you're in a 2,000 calorie diet, a minimum 26 grams of fiber. Now, I like to push it a bit higher for my clients and any female client I'm working with. I'll always ask them to try aim for at least 30 grams. And for any male or any guys, I'll always push them towards 40 grams. So foods that are high in fiber include fruits and vegetables. If you're getting in a, a diet which has adequate amount of calories, your protein at every single meal, and you're also getting in 30 or 40 grams of fiber, it's very, very difficult to go wrong because you're having protein at every meal, your fiber, which will suggest you're having veggies and you're eating nutrient-dense foods and then your calories are intact as well. It's a simple yet sustainable way to actually get in great shape. So some ways to bump up your fiber would be have at least two meals a day with veggies in it. So sometimes for my clients, what I recommend, because I'm not the biggest fan of freaking chopping vegetables either, is I'll just get frozen veg. And you can pop them in the microwave, you can pop them in the steamer, you can cook them up while you're working, while you're at home, while you're heating up your dinner. It's a simple yet easy way to get your fiber intake up. It could be for breakfast, you might be adding spinach to your, to your scrambled egg. For lunch or for dinner, that could be a salad with some, with some vegetables on the side. It's so, so simple. And then some, you know, servings of fruit throughout the day as well. But calories, protein and fiber Big, big habits for you to implement that if you nail your calories, you nail your protein intake, you nail your fiber intake, you're well on your way to creating a good sustainable lifestyle change. Okay. And next habit. So habits again, uh, number, number six is strength training. So I spoke to a guy recently and he told me that he never liked the gym and it just really wasn't for him. I just, again, you always appreciate their knowledge. Never tell anyone that it's right or wrong because I understand that the gym isn't necessarily for everyone, but some people get a bad experience of it, but they've never actually gone through it right. So I just asked him, have you ever followed a plan before? Have you ever, like, did you did you have a plan to follow when you were going to the gym? Did you set goals for yourself? And he didn't have any structure in place. And I'll tell you now, I love the gym, but I know myself, the gym can be a lonely place if you don't know what you're doing when you go in there, or if you've no goal, or if you've no idea what you're working towards. So for anyone who is thinking of strength training, one thing that I would recommend is actually go in with a plan. Decide in advance what you're going to do and have a goal to work towards. A goal can be performance-based where you want to run, we'll say, a 5K in 25 minutes. It can be, I want to do 10 bodyweight chin-ups. It could be, I want to bench press 100 kilos. Whereas a physique-based goal could be, I want to get to 80 kilos at 10% body fat before March 2024. That's a physique-based goal. But I would recommend everyone to have some performance and physique-based goals. And for habit, again, if you're not already doing this, strength training. Strength training is the single most effective form of exercise. Why is this? Because it helps build muscle. And that's important because muscle is more metabolically active than fat. In the more muscle you have, the more calories you burn at rest. So two people could be sitting watching the same show on Netflix, and one guy could have... 20% body fat, the other guy could have 10% body fat. And just by sitting down alone, because the guy with 10% body fat, it was more lean muscle mass, he will burn more calories over an hour, over a two hour period than the guy who's a higher body fat percentage. So the big benefit of this is, there's a reason why people who are jacked who are bodybuilders, they're able to consume five, 6,000 calories a day and still look like they're in shape because they've so much muscle and they burn so many calories at rest that their bodies and their metabolic rate allows them to do that. So that's why strength training is the single most effective form of exercise I believe that anyone can do. And it's important you do a form of exercise that you enjoy, all right? And that will start out with following a plan, having a structure in place, and also having some goals in place. In place. For me personally, I'm a, I'm a big lover of performance and aesthetic-based training. I'm not the biggest fan of just being bodybuilding training. It's for some people, it's not necessarily for me. 
where you're just doing chest on Monday, arms on Tuesday, shoulders on Wednesday. Don't get me wrong. Sometimes I love those pump workouts, but I'm always obsessed over the likes of athletes, the likes of American football athletes who they're able to lift an insane amount of weight. And yet they have a, a 40 meter, 40 meter sprint time of less than four seconds, or they're able to run a hundred meters in, you know, 10, 11 seconds. It's like, how do you get that right balance of performance and aesthetics? And that's what I'm absolutely obsessed about where you can, look the part but also play the part and that's the side of training that i like to deviate towards so i would typically do some form of heavy lifting at the start of my workout maybe some plyometrics so that could be something like a deadlift with a box jump or a deadlift with a broad jump that's where you're focusing on the strength the performance side of things and then i like to do some accessory work so some work that's going to help me build up and increase my deadlift so maybe that could be some rdls it could be for some for my back it could be some t-bar rows to build my grip strength it could be farmer's walks to make sure that my grip strength is is intact when I'm doing deadlifts, whatever it might be. And then I always like to finish my session with some what I call pump and prime work. That's where you're doing more of the bodybuilding work, whether let's just say for a pull session, it could be some bicep curls. For a push session, it could be some tricep pushdowns. But I love combining that combination of strength work, Athlet, athletic work or plyometric base work and then some bodybuilding and pump work and finally then so this is habit number seven leading on to strength training number seven will be doing some element of cardio the importance of doing cardio cannot be understated and this is something that really was surprising to me up until my photo shoot in 2021 i'd never really done any i never thought much of walking and when people are saying, you know, they're doing walking as their cardio, I kind of said, that doesn't really count as cardio. And, you know, there's different forms of cardio and cardio is basically categorized by zones. So zone one to zone five, which imagine zone five is an all out sprint where you're at 100 percent, whereas zone one, it's conversational. It is just, you know, 50, 60 percent of your heart rate. But there's a reason why a lot of bodybuilders do low intensity steady state cardio where they're walking on an incline, the treadmill. It's because it's not very fatiguing or tiring on the body and it allows them to burn a lot of calories. And for me, for my for my second ever photo shoot, so I did a photo shoot in 2020, but I also did one in 2021. And one thing I implemented in 2021 was, okay, I'm going to constantly try to walk 10,000 steps a day. And my training didn't change at all from the previous year. But my physique changed drastically. And that was the single biggest drive and change for me at the time that I just added more walking and added more increased my step count to my current strength training routine. So walking is a baseline minimum I'd recommend anyone to do. And the great thing about any of my clients, let's say you're on a fat loss journey, they're dieting. Sometimes what I will do is rather than decreasing their calories, I'll just increase their activity and increase their step count. So someone might go from 7,500 to 8,500 or someone could go from 10K to 12K. The benefit being that if you go for walk a thousand or two thousand steps, you're not going to be drained after it. Whereas I love running and running is a big part of my identity. But if you run a five or a 10K or you go that bit longer, like it's very, very taxing on the body and you can be very, very fatiguing. And that can often eat, result in you wanting to eat more food and actually eat back and even over consume the exercise calories you burnt. Whereas the benefit of walking is it's not very taxing on the body. It burns about roughly 100 calories per 2000 steps you walk and it's just very like it's it's not fatiguing at all it's a really really great form of cardio so i would recommend everyone to set a uh, set a step count goal for yourself and make sure that you adhere to that every single day all right other forms of cardio then that i found have found beneficial so i really like doing interval cardio where you're working at a higher intensity rate for a period of time before going to a lower intensity rate so let's just say that could be something like on the assault bike. You might do 10 seconds or 15 seconds max effort and a 45 second rest. Repeat that for 10 or 15 minutes. That's what you call more high intensity interval training. With the treadmill, I don't mind running outside when you have something to look at. But when you're on the treadmill, I just I find it very boring to do anything more than a 5K. But what I really like doing is intervals on the treadmill where I might do 30 seconds at a really fast pace. And then 30 seconds, I hop off on the side and rest and repeat that for maybe 20 sets. OK, but uh, that's the form of cardio that's been really beneficial for me. And again, it's a good habit for anyone to implement. But our baseline, what I would say is 
if you want to build some good habits, start out with walking when it comes to cardio and work your way up from there. All right. Following on then, habit number eight is setting an eating window. So when I used to work as a primary school teacher and I was playing football as well at the time, you mightn't get home from football training until maybe half nine, sometimes 10 o'clock at night by the time you actually get back. And I might be gulping down my final meal of the night by half 10 and finish eating. Then all of a sudden you're up for work the following day, off to off to school. And I'm having my first meal again at like half six, seven o'clock in the morning. And I almost felt like at the time when I was eating this meal, and it was still a healthy meal that I was having after training. It might be like protein oats or something. But I felt in the following morning when I was eating my breakfast, I usually would have had an omelet, that my protein oats, they are almost, it feels like they're still stuck in my freaking throat. And I'm eating this food, even though I haven't even fully digested the the meal from the night before. So one thing that's really helped me as setting an eating window where I consume all my calories, typically inside a nine to 12 hour window. Probably at the moment, being honest, because I'm doing a lean bulk, it's more towards the 11 or 12 hours. But when I'm doing a cut, it might be nine or 10 hours just because I'll shorten that eating window. I find it easier to stay within my calories. But that's been something that's been really beneficial for me. And something I would highly recommend everyone to do is try to get all your calories from fasted to fed inside a 12 hour zone. So let's just say you consume, you eat your breakfast at 8 a.m. in the morning, try finish up eating by 8 p.m. Like when you think about it, if you were to go to the hospital tomorrow for a procedure, they'll typically ask you to fast for period of 12 hours and there's a reason to do so it just allows your body to it allows you to flush out we'll say all of the food it allows you time to digest your food before you start eating again and that's a big big reason why a lot of people are overweight because they have a 15 16 hour eating window that you're having your first meal at 7 7 a.m in the morning and you're finishing up eating at maybe 11 o'clock at night set an eating window and try to stay within 12 hours it's been an absolute game changer for me and for some of my clients just for staying within their calorie limit, all right? Um, and finally as well, we all know that at night time, like the danger zone is roughly that 7 to 10 p.m. period or maybe 8 to 10 p.m. where you might be finished your dinner, but you're still a little bit peckish. And typically the food that you eat after 8 or 9 o'clock, it's not the carrots you're going for, it's the freaking chip sticks. So having an eating window will just build that discipline for you. It's going to minimize all of these snack calories and just going to help you move towards whatever goals you have in mind, whether it's fat loss, muscle building or, or body weight maintenance. Okay. Um, final two habits. So this is one which is indirect, not directly related to fitness, but indirectly it's going to help. And that is continuous learning. So I'm a big believer in self-development and just learning and going to bed every single day with being a little bit wiser. So whether I'm doing my workout, I might be listening to a good podcast. First thing in the morning, I'm listening to a self-development book. I'm doing courses. I'm reading books. I'm investing in mentorship. I'm investing in coaching because I know the more knowledge that I have, the more that you learn, the more that you earn, the more that you're able to give back to people, the more you're able to pass on to people. And that's how I learned to build up my knowledge base over the years. When I was a primary school teacher, again, going back to point number one, visualization, having a vision. I knew that I wanted to do and be what I am at the moment, an online fitness coach. So as a result of this, I have to make sure my actions align with my ambitions. And what I always would have done would have been reading books, whether that was Eat Smarter by Sean Stevenson, whether that was any nutrition or training book, doing courses. So I've done CPPS course, Joe DeFranco and Jim Smith, two massive, massive influence on me and how I program and how I train. At the moment, I'm doing J3 University, which is John Jewish strength uh, strength training. He's more in the bodybuilding field. I've done precision nutrition, which is obviously more nutrition based. I've done Brian Kane's nutrition course. I'm doing a business mentorship course at the moment. I'm always into continuous learning and self development. I'm reading Tony Robbins' book, Awaken Awaken the Giant Within, for the third or the fourth time, because again, it just that's going to help train my mind. So train the mind. I'm training the mind, train the body, self-education, self-learning. I'm a big believer in continuous learning. So for anyone listening to this, if you're listening to this podcast, this is an element to learn. I hope you're getting value from it because it's going to change your perspective. It's going to give you some new tips that you can implement into your lifestyle. And one thing that I would recommend for everyone, something I got off Brian Kane, is if you have a commute, make your commute or make your car library on wheels. When I was working as a teacher in Ornmore, I roughly had a 40 minute commute. So what I would have done is instead of listening to the radio and getting all caught up in the diva and the drama about stuff that's not going to realistically impact your life, 
Why not work on yourself and use that time to listen to this podcast, to listen to an audiobook, to listen to something that's going to move you forward rather than just being reactive and listening to the news. The news is all negative. It's going to put you in a bad state of mind. You don't need to be listening or consuming, consuming it. That's why continuous learning. So whether you're out for a walk, whether you're driving, always try to be learning more. All right. So that's something that's just a habit that's really helped change my life. And the final one then is having some form of tracking and assessment. So this was this is something that I do with my clients. And I also, when I was working with my coach, Tony McAlevey, for the bodybuilding, something he got me to do was in my weekly check-in, I would take note of my average weight, what my average calorie and protein intake was for the week, how many strength sessions I did, how many steps, what my average steps were, um, what type of cardio that I was doing, and then finally uploading photos. And if you just take track of some of those things that I just said there, so I'll recap them again if you want to take it down. What's your average weight of the week? So you find your average weight. What I actually do is I weigh myself every day and I divide that by seven. Then what's your average calorie and protein intake? How are you going to find that out? By looking at your MyFitnessPal. How many gym sessions did you do? How many steps did you average per day? And then did you do any additional cardio? And the great thing is I do this now with my clients and we can identify trends that, okay, you've dropped 0.5 kilos a week, but it's not surprising why. I was doing this with a client yesterday. He dropped 0.5 kilos in his cut. And the week before he plateaued. But this week he increased his step count from averaging 8,000 to 11,000. He got four sessions instead of three sessions in. And his calories, his, his diet that he said, his calories that he was on, they were the exact same, but he was just a bit more adhering to the diet. And then that was just good feedback for us to see, okay, so when you track your calories, when you do this amount of steps, when you do this amount of sessions, this is the expected weekly weight loss that we can actually target. And it will just give you some good actual metrics to work towards. So one game-changing habit would be have some form of tracking and assessment tool for your strength, for your training, because if you're not assessing, again, as I said, you're just guessing. But having this laid out, so what I do with my clients, we have it in a simple to follow Excel sheet, and we can see it week to week that week one, this is where we were, this is what your average weight is. And it's so rewarding. When I was doing this for my bodybuilder myself, it's like, geez, you know, sometimes we can be our own worst enemies. You mightn't realize how much progress you're making. But then you look back at, okay, God, I started at this weight, and you know what? I'm actually four kilos lighter now, 12 weeks later. Like I am making progress and God, back then my average step count was only 10,000. Now I'm going up to 12,000 or, you know, at the time I was consuming 2,500 calories with 200 grams of protein. Now that I'm deeper into my cut, I'm able to consume 2,200 calories at 200 grams of protein, but I'm looking much, much leaner. It's just going to give you a lot more tracking and assessment tools for seeing what needs to change, what's working well, what we can improve on. All right. And just one final thing with this is one of my biggest regrets is not taking enough photos when I started out back in the day. So whatever phase you are in your transformation journey, try take a new photo at least once a week. It's just going to be so rewarding because, again, it can be hard to see change in the week to week. But what I do in my client check ins is I will compare the before and after from maybe how they were when they started. And sometimes they're like, oh, my God. I didn't realize how I looked like, how did I actually let myself go so much at the start? But by God, how far have I come as well? And that's why having photos, taking photos, it's a great form of assessment and feedback for you. All right. So they are 10 fitness habits that will change your life. And just for me as well, by no means am I perfect. I need to practice these every single day. And two habits that I need to get better at for next year, first of all, is my sleep. It's definitely improved. I used to be of the opinion that I was freaking Tony Robbins and I could operate in five or six hours. But now I'm going to bed, getting to bed about seven, seven and a half hours before I have to get up. I would like to push that to eight hours as I find that's my sweet spot. And then secondly, something that I want to improve next year is just stress management. That, as I said, sometimes when you're self-employed, there can be no off switch. And that's something that I've had a hard time dealing with since, since I've become a full-time online fitness coach. That your mind is always racing and you can be sometimes going to bed tired and worried because you've got an idea for a content. You've got an idea for a client that you want to implement. You've got an idea for just something you want to put out there. And it can often just be hard to actually wind down and just, you know, relax a bit. And there is more to life than just working on your fitness, working on the business. So for me as well, stress management, something that I want to get better at next year so that 
so that I'm not always tired or not, not that I'm tired of my, but I'm not always just thinking about fitness. I'm not always thinking about improving my service that I'm balancing myself out in other areas of my life and doing things that will just take my mind off, off what I most predominantly think about that is fitness and business. Not that it's a bad thing, but just too much of anything can sometimes be a negative thing. So there are two things that I want to work on. Sleep is definitely improving. One thing that's really helped me, what you heard Gavin McHale speak about two weeks ago, is the brag book, where I write down a list of my wins for the day. And then that's what my mind will focus on as I sleep. It just puts me in a good conscious state at the end of the day that, you know what? Today, you've actually stacked a lot of wins and you've done a lot of great things. You've, you've helped a lot of people out. And sometimes for myself, I mightn't appreciate that because I'm just so caught up in the day to day of just like, you know, Always moving forward, always growth, always development. But sometimes it's important to actually reflect back on some of your wins. That's something that's really helped me. And then from a stress management point of view. So for me, what really works well is spending time outdoors in nature, walking more and human connection, having a good conversation with a friend, with a family member, meeting someone for a coffee, um, just doing something like going for a hike, something like that. It's really it's really helpful for me when it comes to stress management. But that is all for this week's episode. I hope you got value from the show. So these are 10 fitness habits that will change your life. And as I said, look, start off with even just one. It might be you implement a morning routine. Is that you're going to stay more hydrated throughout the day? Is that you're going to do more meal pre- planning or meal preparation? It could be that you're not going to follow a diet, but rather you're going to follow principles. It could be a case that, Okay, I'm going to start tracking my calories, my protein intake, my fiber intake more. It might be a case that you're going to start a progressive strength training program and actually go to the gym with a plan, with some goals in mind. It could be you're going to have it, set yourself a step counter, do more cardio, set yourself an eating window of 12 hours or less. Whether you're going to maybe read one new book a month, it could be something as small as that, or just tracking your average weight, your photos, and using your assessment as tools for where you need to progress and how you want to move forward in the future. But that is all for this week's episode. I really hope you got value from the show. And if you did get value from the show, we're approaching the 100 episode mark. Please, all I'd ask you to do is to uh, make sure you're subscribed, whether it's on Apple or whether it's on Spotify, because podcasts are generally the slowest of all platforms to grow, which is why word of mouth is super important. And this is going to be live as of the 13th of December. So we are three weeks or less than three weeks out from the new year. If you want help with changing your your health and fitness in the new year, you want to level up, you want a goal to work towards, you want some accountability, you want to maybe look good for summertime, whatever it might be, and you need a plan and structure in place, I'll post a link in my bio for my one-to-one online application form for coaching. So I only work with people on a one-to-one basis, and I only work with people who I genuinely believe that I'm a good fit for and you're a good fit for me. How it typically works is we'll initially have a consultation call We'll speak through what your goals are, what some of your challenges are, what you would have tried in the past, and then see if my plan is potentially the right fit for you. So if you are interested in learning more about working with me one-to-one, I'll post a link for my one-to-one application form in my bio. And also, if you want to follow my content, my Instagram is probably the best place to send you. It's at Mac Lifestyle Fitness on Instagram. That's MC Lifestyle Fitness on IG. So be sure to follow me if you're not already doing that there. And I hope you enjoyed this week's episode. Thanks for listening.